I was always a big music fan and uh, followed the career of uh, certain characters like Brian Eno, for example, or Robert Fripp, and people who were um, kind of a little bit on the fringes of of the mainstream and or, or being pretty successful in the mainstream but actually being very inventive also and very sort of conceptually uh, driven. You know we're talking late 70s I have to say you know? so it, it has been a while ago and um, it was quite impressive for me that somebody who had such a reputation as being a successful musician would come to record shops uh, in Hamburg or in Berlin, wherever, and play free concerts. Um, because he was very much kind of driven by the idea that the music should go back to the people who actually buy the records as well. And who, and, and he wanted to just offer also simple ways of how to make interesting music. So you don't need like a big truck of uh, equipment and uh, stuff, but you just be able to do it with very simple equipment. And I was kind of very impressed with that kind of conscious step down on the kind of you know stardom uh, behavior, and um, him him really showing as well that his most in that in that particular time his most he's most focused on making music and trying to uh, also find different ways to bring the music to the people and this combined with with the more theoretical aspects of what Brian Eno had to say about what he thinks uh, is important in music at first but also the way he reaches he, he gets to his results the way he kind of works more on a conceptual level than on a musicianship level. That kind of uh, impressed me, it seems, at the right moment. And then, uh, it must have been like one or two weeks later, I invested the money I was saving up to go for an Africa trip. I saved, I take, took that money and didn't go to Africa and bought myself my first synthesizer. And uh, that's basically the cornerstone of how um, my my interest and in how my kind of direction slowly started to shift. Uh, just a few months later, I was meeting this guy Holger Hiller, and with him I then and he was sort of he planned to to found a band. So again, it seems I was there at the right moment, and we found the band together, <laughs> and basically uh, it took off pretty quickly. We pretty uh, it was very inspiring working relationship. We started off as a duo, very much um, in a similar style as one does music today. It's kind of a bedroom duo. We had one four-track tape recorder, two MS-20 and the microphone, and that's how we made our first records. Well, as I said, you know, um, I was very impressed with Brian Eno, and obviously there's a chain of other musicians who were there, like John Hassel or like Harold Budd, or, you know, that whole ambient electronics thing. Um, I was listening to Cluster. Again, I think I have to admit that I was introduced to Cluster via the records they did with Eno, uh, even though Cluster became a quite important uh, influence for me then as their own team without, without Eno. And then I listened to a lot of jazz, I have to say. I listened to always have to mention Miles Davis, which is kind of a, a musician I've been following through the years. Obviously there's various depths of interest, you know, certain times. I'm pretty much interested in the time from sort of 68 to 75. And, but that, for example, still is to this day a, a big source of uh, inspiration or energy or also just awe. I'm just, I'm just still very impressed with, with that sort of with that phase of what he did then with when he started getting into the more electric, not so much electronic, but more electric side of things. And then there, I had my, my pet groups, which everybody else hated. One of them was Weather Report. <laughs> and uh, that's sort of what comes to mind now. Obviously, if you would talk to me tomorrow, I might say something completely different, but um, this is basically kind of 
the, one of the main core of music I was listening to. But interestingly, you mentioned Tepesh Mor because uh, we got to know them at that time. We played with them together in England. We were invited by Daniel Miller to do the first Mute Night. And um, because uh, Holbert knew him, he was friends with uh, Der Plan, which is a kind of interesting um, Neue Welle project from Düsseldorf. So, um, to cut a long story short, we were playing with as a support band for Depeche Mode in the very early days in '81. And uh, even though I have great respect for them, their music itself never really influenced me in that sense. But uh, especially, especially today, when you look at this kind of impressive career they they built out of this. Um, early TV synth pop they were doing. I think um, it's quite interesting and it's quite um, encouraging also to see that this is possible, you know. Since I was quite good in contact with a, with, a, with a certain polygram label at the time, Phonogram in, in Germany, I felt, okay, I should use my assets, I should use my, my, my possibilities and suggested them that I, I would like to uh, open a label to actually give this music a certain base and also to, you know, try networking that word didn't exist, uh, all that kind of electronic interaction and communication didn't exist so it was um, it looks looking back it looked like um, this looks pretty kind of uh, super homemade in a way and, and very early days but it, for me it was a way of uh, first of all also connecting some of those artists which didn't know each other uh, and secondly it was for me my passion to give this music where I thought this is gonna be the basically the future of music, <laughs> how, how plastic can you go? But this is about how plastic I will go today. So um, this, is, this is what I thought would be an important contribution to the German music scene, basically. You know? And then shortly after when this, this connection with Phonogram not so much break up, but it was obvious that Phonogram could really work with this sort of music. Their kind of machine, which worked good for dire straits, wouldn't really work so well for marathons. That's it. Uh, Moritz von Oswald's uh, first project after after Palachambo. So I went to England and figured, okay, then let's uh, try it another way around. And that's uh, that's how I met Alex Patterson. He was an A and R at that time with EG with the EG label. And he immediately thought, okay then, that sounds interesting to us, you know, and that basically gave a business connection, which then was more for me delegated between the musicians and their future partners in England. So later on it became, uh, became more than, again, German related. But first of all, you know, I mean, the way we grew up with music, England and America were the places where the music were coming from and where the music was sold and was kind of presented to the world. It was still a very rare occasion that someone like Kraftwerk could do something in Germany. 
being German, sounding German, and having such an impact. But I have to say, at the same time, I have to admit that this was always kind of the aim, being as pure and as and as clear as Kraftwerk were in their ambition to actually make German music. You know, also with Schaumburg, that was something we often said to ourselves, you know, we don't want to sound like an English band, we don't want to sound like an American band, we want to sound like a German band, and we have to invent how a German band would be sounding like, because there was no, at that time for us, there were no real idols in, in, the, in the field we were working in. We respected DAF, we respected Der Plan, we respected Cluster and, and Kraftwerk, even though we didn't sound like it, we, and we had a respect for their unique style. And as well, like say Neubauten, for example, we were not fans of Neubauten because we liked their music so much, but, but we were fans of them because they invented their own world. And they invented their own musical language. And that was basically always something which made me also be a little bit from the art school, whereas in the art school you think once you have kind of good tutors and professors, it was quite clear, you know, making good art is not about copying something, it's about inventing something. Uh, Alex was starting to do these so-called ambient sets, DJ sets, and we hung out with Jimmy Corti from KLF, and they started actually the Orb together, the first team of the Orb were Jimmy and Alex. In the beginning, it, for me, it was an amazing learning process. First of all, the kind of trust they had in me. And second of all, the chaos I was confronted with. And I think it, pretty early on, it showed I'm quite good at sorting out their chaos, bringing some kind of direction into it. Because that was, for me, all, seems to be all, always a little bit the, the kind of point, not so much, yeah, yeah, we could this or we could that, but actually, let's do this, you know, to actually find something to move onwards with, you know. So, um, and that was a good give and take, you know. They gave me lots of self-confidence, and I could give them a little bit of um, direction, in that sense. A direction within their own ideas, you know, but actually say, this was good what you did there, you know, keep going, doing that, you know. So, then it was a little mixture between collaborator and producer. So in the beginning I was often credited as the co-producer, but more and more I also became less interested in the actual producer function. Whereas I thought it was always like producer is someone from the outside and I was more interested in the musicians again, you know. In the 80s as well, like the producers were the man, you know. When a certain band you didn't know their name of was produced by say a certain person, you wanted to listen to it. So there were, for the music geeks, there were, were the stars. <laughs>